So thank you all, and uh, I invite now uh, index cards if you have questions for the panelists. But and so uh, allow me to prime the pump here a little bit. Um, I'll start with Malini, who just finished. If you just implied uh, that you 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 uh, made this interesting example of these three cheetahs as being naturally solitary, but demonstrating sponta apparently spontaneously a uh, t a, a latent ability, uh, you implied that there was a latent underlying ability to do social cooperation. Would you predict that that would be true in domestic cats? Um, so that was obviously a little bit of a reach because we have one non-pack hunting species that happened to pick it up. But there is some evidence that feral cats do cooperate um, and can cooperate and they form colonies. So. I think that we definitely need more data, and I think we would need to see more of these exceptional examples. I was just going to ask if you thought that maybe a future study should go in this direction. You know, this notion that cats are solitary is um, so ingrained that we think of them as almost always solely solitary. But if they have this sort of latent ability, and you know, many species have have a variable social structure under different circumstances, it may be true for maybe more true for cats. Yeah. Yes, please. Um, Jim, Jim Serpel. I had a question also for Melina. Um, I guess when we talk about uh, teaching or instruction in humans, it's often used as a sign of uh, humans having theory of mind. In other words, a knowledge that another individual has information uh, that, sorry, lacks information that you have and that you can impart. And I'm just wondering whether you could comment on whether you think the female cat who's bringing the prey to her kittens has really any cognitive awareness of the kitten's lack of knowledge or whether the cat is simply o operating on sort of some kind of instinctive autopilot. Yeah, so that's a great question. And it comes up a lot, especially in relation to cats teaching hunting. And I think the answer is it, it can be very simple. I don't think we know enough about their theory of mind to make any conclusion about that yet, but I think that that type of behavior could be very simple, and it could be a series of inborn responses, um, you know, a, a sort of innate process that the mother has in terms of offspring, offspring rearing. To ex <coughs> excuse me, to War extend, Warren Johnson. Yes, to extend that, um, it's been shown in some carnivores that there's a certain period of time during development if you give them food, then never offer it to them again, but later in life, give them that choice experiment, they'll go back and choose what they were offered during that time period. And so I guess I'm thinking a little bit broader in terms of prey selection. Um, you know, there's an, um, a lot of debate about, for instance, what might turn a tiger into a man-eater, or why some pumas may attack humans and not, or um, may prey on sheep, or, or, or that level of prey selection. Um, do you have any insights on what may be going on with, sure. with domestic cats, for instance? Um, yeah, I mean, so the, the step of the mother bringing back prey to the young is, um, it's virtually universal across all cats, and that is the major function of it, is it's thought. And they've done laboratory experiments where, you know, the mother only has, you know, birds available or only has rodents available, and of course they develop those preferences. Um, the actual mechanism, um, the memory mechanism that occurs, I don't really um, have any sort of knowledge about. Very good. Jim Albert. Yes, I had kind of a comment for Dr. Johnson, and that was I, you, you gave me a lot of relief because one of my areas of interest is the preservation of these, these great cats that have taken millennia to produce. And yet, unfortunately, they're being wiped out uh, at record paces in Africa and other continents. Uh, it's just nice to know that your research has shown that there is a lot of genetic diversity among captive cats, and I find that very refreshing because, you know, the, the elephant in the room, unfortunately, on, on, on these cat populations is, of course, uh, approaching human population, so it's, it's one thing to develop these genetics and, and embryo bank and species preservation, but unfortunately, unless, unless you can provide habitats uh, for these animals outside of managed populations, I mean, it's, I don't know. It would be rather a sad thing, I think. 
but it's it's good that you're you have that research. You know, they predict in 25 years that uh, large cats outside of managed populations uh, they'll be extinct. You know, lions and, and tigers and whatnot. Yeah, so you just, you actually bring up a couple of, of excellent points. One is um, you, you, know, you brought up the uh, the concept of biobanks, and it, it is something that that should be on all of our minds in some ways. The you know, it's, it's very clear that what we can do now in terms of, of describing the genome and what it does is, is just in its barest inf infancy. We know much more now about what we don't know than we used to, but um, what we do know is um, you know, really not much. So we, don't miss, we, we still don't even know what are the important parts to um, preserve, but we, are, we now have the tools, for instance, to see where selection is happening. You, you know, we have the tools to see, well, we know selection happens the minute you take these animals into captivity, but now we have the tools to start saying, okay, well, what, what are the differences? We, what are the, what's happening from one population to the other? But preserving what we have now in some viable way, whether it be through these gene banks or through other kinds of samples, and preserving those with the phenotypes that go with what it is you're looking at, um, whether it be behavior or disease or whatever, what that really allows us to do is in the future when we have better tools and know much more about the genome, we can go back and learn what we have hopefully not lost, but learn what is, you know, what, what's important to, to preserve, so to speak. So, um. Thank you. Now, I, I have to address the next question that is on everyone's mind. It comes from the audience and comes it's on everybody's mind to Dr. Mendel. Um, the saber tooths that you brought up just at the end uh, have to be explained. Uh, you have to, to made the case that the large cats go for a throat bite, and if certainly a throat bite wouldn't lend itself to needing a huge canine. So what, what, is, what is your punchline on the saber tooth? Well, if you would help me with that punchline, in the, in the lectern there, you have a skull, skull of a saber tooth. Just <laughs> So Mike is going to show you an important point here. So he has now opened the jaw, and, and if you see Mike, could you step out in front of the light so they can actually see that in profile, perhaps? There you go. <laughs> um, he's now having to open the jaws exceedingly wide. This cat had to do that to clear its own canines. And so one of the problems with having six, seven inch long fangs is you now have to open your lower jaw a very long way just to get a meaningful <coughs> gate. And so one of the few places that one of these cats presumably could bite is in this narrow part of the throat. So next time you're stroking a horse or a cow or any of the big ungulates, right, notice how narrow their throats are. So I've walked around with this very cast at the Buffalo Zoo. Um, and whenever they captured some animals for some experiment or for some physical or whatever, I was trying to figure out where you could bite these animals. And as it turns out, I know, she thought she got laughed at a lot. Um, as it turns out, I think the only place you really could bite is the throat. And so very quickly, one, I think on thick-skinned animals, something that we didn't know about until we started doing our weird experiments, we were biting horses, cows, deer, all kinds of other things with mechanical jaws that I didn't have any time to talk about. In thick-skinned animals, those teeth will go across the neck, but they could never actually penetrate the skin. So you saw some slides up here of cats up on top of big animals. Next time you see them on film, there's no blood anywhere. They're not even penetrating the skin. So I think that saber-toothed cats were using the same kind of bite as modern-day big cats to simply cut off the carotids, right? But on thin-skinned animals, I didn't know this until we started doing the experiments. Deer, horse, for instance, have very thin skin. At about 150 pounds of bite force, something that you could do with your own jaws, <laughs> um, that upper canine can, and often does, slide, pops through the skin, and starts pushing the skin out the other side. Turns out those blades, and if you want to come up afterwards, you can feel the teeth, there are slight serrations on the top and bottom edges of those teeth. And now the canine, sorry, the carotids are pinned down because everything is compressed in the animal's neck. It's the equivalent now, I think, of taking a fork in very rare steak, right? 
try cutting a steak with a serrated knife without forking it. <laughs> it just goes all over the plate, right? But if you pin it down, then that serrated blade does a really nice job. And if you can nick a karate, boom, it's done. So I think the evolution of saber-toothy offers these animals the capacity to kill in the same way modern-day big cats do, with the long time delay, right? But in some instances, they can kill much more quickly if they specialize in thin-skinned animals. And therefore, uh, the competition among saber-toothed cats and conical-toothed cats, which were in competition in North America all over the world right up until 10,000 years ago. So I think these guys had a little bit broader toolkit, and that's why that might explain the multiple evolutions of saber-toothing among the cats and even other cat-like carnivores, including marsupials. Thank you. Wayne Pacelli. Yeah, I had a question for uh, Dr. Johnson. Uh, you uh, presented a lot of information about what the new genomic work is allowing for in terms of insight about these species and subspecies. Um, with the Florida panthers, of course, they're a subspecies and they're protected under the U.S. Endangered Species Act as a subspecies. As we get more information about these different carnivores, and you brought up the tigers, and I think you added a couple of subspecies that have been identified. I guess two questions. One, what's the criteria for differentiating uh, some animals from others and classifying them as subspecies? And what do you think the consequences for conservation and wildlife protection are? I mean, certainly in the United States, um, if you can do subspecies, if you identify a subspecies, and there could be federal protections that has all sorts of consequences for habitat protection and lethal take of the animals. I, I was thinking of wolves. You know, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service seems to be bunching them all together. You know, when I was growing up, we called the wolves in the upper Great Lakes timber wolves, and most people don't call them that anymore. They're all gray wolves now, although, you know, some people continue to. So I guess just thoughts on the issue of of subspecies and more and more of them because we're getting this information and what the standards are and what the conservation implications are. <clears throat> yeah, an absolutely excellent question and one that's been discussed, debated um, you know, for decades. These, and, and there's no one right answer, really, and it it's, um, often comes down to what group of species you're talking about or what individual species you're talking about, how the community decides to, to use that, the different names or nomenclatures for it. But from a genetic perspective, um, what you would like to see for whatever unit you're going to measure, in this case it's a subspecies that we're talking about, but it might, as, it might well just be a population, you're trying to look for shared genetic traits, something that ideally is important, um, selected for. Um, you often want that actually to be unique, so identifiable for that population or that subspecies. It's not found elsewhere, or at least it's um, in higher frequency. And, and really what you want to start seeing is, it, you know, it's, so those two things imply a shared ancestry, and then some kind of an isolation, you know, or, or um, reduced gene flow. And the presumption has always been, well, so with the Florida panther, well, it lives in a very different place than Western United States or the, the pampas of South America. So the presumption is that it probably has adaptations to the Everglades, to the parasites, to the you know, tick-borne diseases, to et cetera, that the other cats don't have. That you, so you could start to imagine that there is something unique that's, that could be lost to that. So um, those are the things that, from a genetic perspective, that one can now start measuring. Um, but it becomes much, much more complicated with all of these um, genomic tools. And the, the delineation, so, so these tools have allowed us to um, identify things that are easily identified as unique, and, and, and so it's, it's no 
surprised that you might identify new island species or things that have been isolated for a long period of time. What is surprised when things are in the same area and have unique adaptations, and, and that's going to be more and more common, even within wolves, beginning to find that the structure is not necessarily geographic or obvious. Um, there could be reduced gene flow simply from a behavioral perspective. And then, so that does bring um, interesting consequences, and it will be very difficult to legislate that, um, especially because we're living in perturbed worlds now, right? Not just the last bit of human history, but even beyond that. But we're living then in a world where we're moving animals around ourselves, and then we're living in a world that's changing rapidly, both because we're changing it, and it seems like there's, there's other patterns that are changing. So um, the management of genetic variation is going to be a, a huge problem. We probably have the, the luxury, though, to manage things like the Florida panther for only a relatively small number of species and populations. St st stemming from that topic, uh, do you, and very briefly, do you, if you had your druthers, would you split the four subspecies of Felis sylvestris into species status, especially given the data you show that one and only one of them seems to be the origin of the domestic cat, or mostly the origin? Well, I think one way of, that, that we have, um, we as several of us that have been, been working across cat evolution, one thing you'd like to see is, is a consistency among at least the cats. So whether that be in the amount of time they've been diverged or other sorts of other criteria like that. Are those um, criteria met for Felis sylvestris? Probably not. Probably not. So, so, so now, and before we leave uh, the Felis uh, uh, domesticus, did you really uh, telling us that there are bobcat genes in our, there's interbreeding with bobcats? Well, it's, it's been shown to be theoretically and has has happened, um, whether that's of any um, evolutionary importance or, or practical importance. Um, All the cat owners are going to go home and look again at their own cats. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, certainly bobcats and lynx, for instance, they, they, they hybridize freely. So, and, and other species hybridize freely. The more and more we use these genetic te um, techniques, actually, hybrid zones among species is the, more the rule than the exception, hmm. for, especially among carnivores. So um, it's, you know, it's, not, it's not an unreasonable uh, thought. Any additional questions? J Jerry de Zizula. Uh, I have a sort of a combined question from Alani and um, Dr. Mendel. Um, prey behavior, the prey sequence, is seen in orphan kittens almost programmed at a certain age. And they'll go around and start um, doing prey behavior with dust bunnies and paper and balls and things like that. Um, how much of what you attributed to teaching and learning is that prey behavior that kicks in and then mom brings a toy and then it is trial and error for them to actually make the kill. And you made, um, you know, you didn't get that far, but I'm assuming you were going to talk more about the behavior, the prey sequence, things like that. Um, so I think that the general idea behind the, the teaching from the mother is that it sort of channels it in the right direction and it gives them a chance to practice on actual prey that can get away before their life depends on that. Um, I think that the critical thing that's been shown in relation to that is that if they don't have that interaction with the mother, they are ultimately a lot less efficient at catching prey. So to a certain degree, they can probably still do it because there are these elements, you know, in their behavior that are just there and they do have the tendency, anything that moves, you know, to jump at it and those kinds of things. But I think the idea is that it's basically a refinement process. Okay, so thank you very much. I'm going to continue to keep us right on time. Uh, so just in closing, let me tell you uh, that this, of course, was just the introductory. I hope it gave you a taste of what is to come tomorrow. Um, we will reconvene here tomorrow at 8.45 a.m. and uh, focus for most all of the rest of this symposium on the domestic cat. Um, I thank all the speakers. I thank you all for coming, and I'll see you tomorrow.